let's get to Frank Saravalli from Daily Faceoff. Hello, Frank. How are you doing? I'm good. Uh, look, Boardsy, uh, not a good look. The uh, the sideburns, they're a little unkempt today, by the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, a little all over the place. And I can say that as someone that as soon as we're done here, I'm going to go get a haircut for the first time in six weeks. So much needed. Uh, but, you know, maybe red's not your color. Maroon, burgundy. And uh, and Liam, I don't know why, but every time I, you know, message you or I see you on the tube, I, I, I want to call you Liam. I don't know why. I have been passed around many nicknames recently, Frank. Lehman is the new one going around the other's nation office. Right so now. I was at uh, I was at the World Juniors in Czech Republic a few years ago. This was the Alexi Lafreniere year, and Liam Foodie was on the team, but they mm. couldn't properly pronounce his name. So the Czech PA guy, he would be like, "Goal scored by Liam Foodie," <laughs> and you're like, "What?" <laughs> I am like, can you do, like Lee, uh, just call him Liam? Like, it's not that difficult, but apparently it was. And now I want to apply that nickname to you. You can call me whatever you want as long as you come on the show on a weekly basis, Frank. <laughs> okay, well, that's a deal. Okay, so first question I have for you obviously, I want to stay on the positive side of this story to start with, but Zach Hyman scored his 51st goal yesterday for the Edmonton Oilers. The season he's had has been incredible. And I guess, what are your thoughts on just his season as a whole, but also? The conversation now that he's one of the best free agent sign-ins in the cap era, like obviously there's big names like Niedermeyer, Chara, and Holsa, but that cap hit is kind of the part that I think people indicate to him why he could be one of the best. You had to go there with money with Hyman, didn't you? <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, look, I for the Oilers, he has delivered on every aspect that you could have possibly ever hoped. Like, I think they were you know, cautiously optimistic when they signed him a huge jump in the pay that he was making in Toronto. And I think when you go back to, you know, he was completely serviceable there and also mm -hmm. played with high end players. You know, I, I think part of the conversation that you get into with certain guys around the league is I love the player at two, three, five, but all of a sudden at five, whatever, I'm going, Ooh, I don't, I don't know. Is he, is he worth it? And so certain different players around the league, they get, um, you know, reputations based on their value relative to cap. And I think as, as hockey media, as, uh, as fans of the game, unfortunately, so many guys are viewed only through their prism. And, and I think Connor Brown's probably an unfair example to point out just because, uh, look, any, any guy that goes through 60 games of the year and hasn't scored is going to be appropriately, um, you know, sort of thrashed about mm. on social media, but a lot of what we, however fans and, and the market perceives Brown now moving forward, who by the way is kind of hot and, yeah. um, you know, all of a sudden it becomes a different conversation, but it's like, God, we're stuck with three million next year on the cap. It's all Connor Brown's fault. And he's, you know, he's screwed up our summer. And like you, you view players a lot of times through the prism of their cap hit. And and sometimes that's fairly, sometimes it's unfairly, but I think it's the cap uh, as a whole has changed the dynamic of how we think about and consume hockey, which in some ways is kind of a suck on mm -hmm. the fandom part of it, I think. Uh, Frank, Liam decided that he wanted to go positively to start. I'm going to go negative here to address the elephant in the room. Andrew Berkshire yesterday with arguably the dumbest take of all time. We're not going to use that name, by the way. Like, we're we're done. Okay. That, there, there's no credit being given here. Okay. So go ahead. So that, that guy came out with arguably the worst take of all time. And you can come at players. You can do whatever. He's not the first. He won't be the last to do it. But, Frank, it felt like he was coming at the media and hockey media in general about not reporting the stories. I've got your tweet right here. I thought you did a great job. Great use of the GIF as well. This made me giggle away. Frank, uh, just tell us what are your thoughts on this entire situation? Because I thought it was uncalled for to Hyman and uncalled for to hockey writers in the media. I think that there's multiple layers to unpack here. I think you hit on uh, two of them. Uh, there are more. Um, the fact that there wasn't a another damning video made attacking Sam Reinhardt. 
mm-hmm. uh, after he scored 50. And if you actually look at the map, the heat map of where both of these players have scored, the vast majority of their goals this season uh, are remarkably similar. Um, Sam Reinhardt, I guess you could also say, had a privileged uh, upbringing uh, as his dad not only had a successful NHL all-star career, but also was a very prominent uh, stockbroker, if you will, uh, that it certainly had some success. What? Why not any criticism for Sam Reinhardt? And it can't just be that because this person doesn't watch Panthers games that um, there's no criticism. To me, there was a healthy undertone of anti-Semitism that, frankly, um, I, I will not stand for. Uh, I've had enough. I think it's disgraceful. And I'm going to begin to call these people out for some of the tropes that they want to attach to uh, the social media discourse that goes back and forth. Um, I I really hesitated before doing so because I don't want to give uh, people like him more oxygen. But at some point, you need to call out the clowns. You need to have an honest and and forthright conversation. And... I think the clap back on social media, which hockey Twitter never agrees on anything (laughs) at any point in time to be solely united against one person and one take and opinion. I mean, that there it is from, from wit, like, you know, you, you never want to, this is I think either he or someone else had this at, at some point yesterday too, which is like on, on, on social media, on Twitter, at any point in any given day, one person is the main character asshole. And you never want to be that person. So you should set out on your course of, you know, whatever uh, your IV drip of choice is on social media, whether it's Instagram or Twitter or whatever. You you never want to be that person. And he was that person yesterday. So congratulations. And uh, I had an NHL coach text me this morning who said, uh, let me scroll through my messages here and find it, because he saw the the next video that this person put out, and he (laughs) said, someone needs to tell him that the best way to get out of a hole is to stop digging. And I (laughs) was like, okay, well said. So, um, look, we can, and I'm happy to engage in unpacking the other parts of this, but, you know, don't think for a second that like we're sitting here in the hockey media pulling the wool over everyone's eyes and not talking about some of the systemic issues that exist and barriers that exist in the game. Um, it's, it's not hockey media's fault. We're not lazy. We're not, not doing our jobs. And the other part is even if you have some of these, uh, privileges or legs up or whatever it is that you want to call it, which there's no question or denying that Zach Hyman did. You don't just, the Toronto Maple Leafs don't hand you a spot in the NHL. You don't then just get to play with Austin Matthews and Mitch Marner. And then you don't, uh, someone doesn't give you 38 million bucks in Edmonton and you don't just get to play with Connor McDavid because your daddy had money. And you don't score 51 goals on accident, Mm -hmm. whether or not you did all the work and they're ethical or unethical, whatever bullshit that is that people want to, you know, put forth. You know, there is talent, there is skill, you know, would he have made it this far without some help along the way? No, but everyone at some point or another, whether it's from a coach, a mentor, a parent, uh, someone that sees something and then the work that you put in to accomplish that. I know that was like a four minute answer, but there's a lot to unpack. Uh, yeah. And it's all, it's all extremely true. Isn't it? Like why? I don't know. I don't want to get into it too much more, but just on a, I guess we'll stick back to the IC. So Ev- positive Liam. Stop being so positive. <laughs> well, I want to talk to you about Van de Kane too, because that was kind of a story that got thrown under the rug a little bit because of everything. That Not happened. so positive. Yes, but obviously had a, a maintenance day, I guess we're calling it against the I Ottawa think we Senators. Can just call it a healthy scratch. No. I guess that's part of my question. Like, why wouldn't the Oilers just call it a healthy scratch? Like, I know only a week before it was like Sean Katori and John Tortorella had their whole thing, which they don't is want what the it smoke. is. But 
but does it not create more smoke by saying it was that? And then obviously Evander Kane's going to come out and say something, right? And well, to his credit, that's he part played of the thing well. is like let maybe they're just letting him bury himself. And mm. and if you watch his face during the interview, like he cannot. There is no ability that Evander Kane has to help himself. <laughs> he continues to be his own worst enemy, and. I don't know that there's ever fixing that, to be honest. Um, but there was an easier way to do this. There was an easier way to engage in the conversation. And he can't just, you know, let the situation play itself out. He he more or less had to tell everyone that it wasn't his choice and that he wasn't hurt. And instead of it just being a maintenance day, it became more than that. And so now you're left with, you know, these questions of Chris Knobloch and then whatever else, if you want to make them, I, I think the bottom line is, is this, and it's clear. Um, one, Evander Kane's not playing well. Mm. And, you know, you could say Tuesday was a step in the right direction against the Jets and one of the better games he's played of late. Fine. Uh, two, for the Oilers to get to where they need to get to this season, they need a lot more from him. And we've seen in playoffs past how much of a game changer he can be. And, and also last year against Vegas, when he's not right and not performing, how much of a detriment that can be to this team. He does change the, I think their fortunes depending on how he's playing. And then three, this part is becoming crystal clear to me and others is his act is wearing thin and it will, it's, it's uh, a tale as old as time. He starts off really well in any new place that he goes to. And it's like a coach, the clock begins to tick. And at some point the Oilers will probably have to address it before his contract is up. It may or may not be as soon as this summer. But he wears out his welcome. It's it's fact. It's not opinion. And I had the sense that his act was already beginning to wear with these Oilers players well before you get some video that pops up with Leon Dreisaitl and Evander Kane jawing at each other. Now, some I don't have the chat up on my screen, but I bet you there's some fans that are in the chat that are saying, why, why do this? Why are you saying this? Why make this a bigger yeah. thing than it is? That I'm just reading the room without yeah. even seeing it, and the answer is because that's what the truth is. Like it, love it, hate it, Oilers fanboy glasses or not, it's that's fact. So mm -hmm. I'm just gonna say it. it. Is he someone that's becoming more and more difficult to move? Then, like you said, like this is a trend now where at the start he's really good and people love him. And then all of a sudden he wears off very quickly. Like, are they going to have a more difficult time moving him than they, than you think they could? I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't think it's necessitated anything right now. Mm -hmm. I think, um, when he's on, um, relative to cap hit, he's, he's a fine player. And, yeah. and like, I just saying his praises of, in terms of, how big and critical pivotal of a piece he could be for this team in this playoff run. Um, like, please don't misunderstand that and um, recognize and potentially separate a uh, player from person and player from teammate, which I think the Oilers, um, their front office went into this eyes wide open. Uh, frankly, their leadership and their captain who had gone into um to Ken Holland's office at the time and said, go get this guy. They, they knew and have heard all the stories. They knew what they were signing up for. Uh, but they felt like this is a player that could really help them. And maybe someone else at some point in time without a crazy amount of term now halfway through the deal will feel that way at some point. So, um, I I'd say right now don't need to do anything and won't be yeah. difficult to move, but, a, let's see how far this goes, and B, let's see what the aftermath is. Uh, I got one for you, Frank, here. It's, you talk about one guy who's maybe had a little negative impact in the room in Evander Kane. One guy who's been a great addition in the room is Corey Perry, the worm. 
got in a fight last night, even though he probably shouldn't have taken that fight. But that's what I love about Corey Perry. I saw some people in the chat asking earlier, so I'll ask it. What do you think the likelihood of Corey Perry sticking around in Edmonton is? It's a one-year deal. He's 38 years old. He scored 10 goals so far. He seems like he still has more in the tank. What have you heard or what are you thinking? I think that is going to be entirely up to Corey Perry. I mean, um, what is this fit from a family perspective? Does he, let's see what the playoffs look like. Um, knowing Corey Perry a bit, uh, I think part of his thought process is that he's going to keep playing this game until someone takes it away from him, kicking and screaming. Uh, in fact, the last few stops that he's had, I think one of the things that he's been craving has been some stability and he likes to get set up in a place and, you know, understand what the expectations are, what the coaching staff is like, what the environment's like and his teammates and has, you know, more often than not wanted to stay. Um, think back to that two year deal that he had in, in Tampa and they, they really wanted him to, uh, you know, they, they, they wanted the term, uh, and he wanted it too. So, um, I don't have a crystal ball. I, I, I'd say that I'd be shocked if he's not playing next season. And I, I just, it's not clear to me yet if he'll be back in Edmonton. And I think the other part of it is who's going to be the GM in Edmonton. Maybe Corey Perry. Maybe someday. Maybe someday. But there you go, Frank. That's all the questions we have. We've taken up quite a lot of your time. So thank you very much for, for stopping by, and we'll see you next time. Have a good one. See ya. See ya, Frank. Let's get some haircuts. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, Nation citizens? If you like that video, then you need to be subscribed to the Oilers Nation YouTube. Podcasts, live shows, exclusive interviews and analysis, everything you need from your favorite voices at Oilers Nation. And you don't want to miss any of it, so hammer that subscribe button.